Thank you all for coming. It's great to be here with you. I'm uh, presently on a uh, th nearing the end of a 30-day speaking tour that began in San Diego on April 1st. Uh, 23 cities later, here I am in your community. Happy to be with you all. I work for the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space that was created 20 years ago to prevent the nuclearization and the weaponization of space. And I can report to you that we're still at it and that the situation is actually getting worse before it's getting any better. But first I want to tell you a bit about myself. I grew up in a military family. My father was in the Air Force. And as a young uh, boy, we moved around the world to various communities. And in 1968, we were living in the panhandle of Florida, northwest Florida. It's so conservative there, they call it Lower Alabama. And I had my first organizing experience at the age of 16, working on the Nixon campaign when he was running for president. And I did such a good job in that campaign. They asked me to sit at the head table at a fish fry fundraiser they had that evening. Along with their keynote speaker, a man that you probably will recognize his name, former Senator Strom Thurmond from South Carolina. So uh, that's how I got started in politics. And from there, it went downhill. In 1971, I myself tried to join the Air Force. I wanted to be a career man like my dad, but I flunked my induction physical because of an old high school football injury. So when most people were trying to stay out of the military because of the Vietnam War, I tried to get in. And after my training, I was sent to a base in California that was an airlift base for the war in Vietnam. And GIs would come from all over America to get on the plane to go to Vietnam. And when the planes would return, they would bring the body bags of the dead soldiers back home. And I would see them on the flight line virtually every day. Well, when I checked into the barracks on my first day there, they looked down this list and they said to me, oh my God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, we only have one room left. Get your bags, follow me, the man said. And we walked down this long, dark hallway, and he kept saying to me, really, we'll get you out of there as soon as possible. And I thought it would be a little room closet with a cot, and I'd spend a night or two there. But he opened the door, and we walked in, and there on the wall were anti-war posters filling the entire room, small room with two beds in it. And as it turned out, this was the room of the leading GI resistance movement organizer in the barracks. And they were trying to keep him isolated because they didn't want him to infect anyone. But they ran out of rooms. And then they forgot about me. And so there I was. And at night, there would be a knock on the door and white guys would come in with chairs and sit in a circle talking about the war in Vietnam. And I'm sitting in the corner, this young Republican for Nixon that I was, thinking, my God, these must be communists. And then another night, there was a knock on the door, and black guys came in with chairs and sat in a circle. They were Black Panthers from the cities, talking about racism in the military and racism in America. And I'm sitting in the corner thinking, my God, these are communists. <laughs> and then they started smoking marijuana. Now, I had heard of marijuana before, it's true. But, you know, I grew up on these military bases behind the barbed wire fences. I was a Boy Scout, very patriotic. And so I want to promise you all that I swear to God, in the immortal words of Bill Clinton, I never, ever inhaled. Never did I. <laughs> but, but, we've learned a lot over the years about the effects of secondhand smoke on innocent people. And so I believe I'm indeed a victim of secondhand smoke because that smoke from marijuana, you know, obviously got into my brain, had some effect on me because within a few months my chair came into their circle and I began participating in their discussions and I began reading their publications, their GI newsletters that would go under the door at night and 
in all the barracks. And so after six months, I decided that I was a conscientious objector. And so I asked to be released from the military. And their first question to me was, oh, really, what's your family history? Do you come from a traditional peace church? The Quakers, the Mennonites, the Church of the Brethren? And I said, no, actually, I, I was a young Republican for Nixon from a military family. And so they turned me down. I did three and a half years of what I called hard time. Because after I figured out what was going on in Vietnam, it was excruciatingly difficult for me to be in the military. But when I got out, I went back to Florida where my family had retired, and I was going to the University of Florida, just ready to graduate. And I got recruited by the United Farm Workers Union to become an organizer of fruit pickers in Florida. And so I quit college, never to finish, to become a professional organizer, and I've been doing it ever since. In the early 80s, I went to work for the Florida Coalition for Peace and Justice, and because of our proximity to the Space Center, you can imagine we began to focus on Star Wars, on moving the arms race into space. But tonight, uh, this afternoon, I want to talk to you about the military <clears throat> industrial complex, corporate criminal syndicate. But to do that, I have to tell you one more story from my youth. When I was about 15, <coughs> I decided that I wanted to be an FBI agent so that I could fight organized crime. And so I sent away for a correspondence course, FBI correspondence course, because being the good Boy Scout that I was, I knew the motto, be prepared. So I figured I'd get a head start on everybody else. And I learned about fingerprints, that everyone has a distinct fingerprint. And they also sent along a book of FBI definitions. And I remember one of those definitions to this day. M.O. Modus operandi. Every criminal has an M.O. They have a way of repeating the same behavior over and over again. So that's what I want to talk to you about. And to do that, we have to go back to the Civil War, the time in America when the weapons corporations were making a lot of money Thank you. off essentially both sides during that war. But as the Civil War ground to an end, the weapons corporations saw a drying up of their profits, as you can imagine. But of course, there were still the Indian Wars going on out west, although they too were being brought to a conclusion. Out in Texas, the Comanches were being brought onto the reservation. In the Dakotas, the Lakota people, Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull in their bands were still on the run, even though most of the Lakota people had been brought onto the reservation. And even out here in Washington State, where uh, I spoke the other day in Walla Walla, uh, that's where Chief Joseph, I learned, was born. So even in 1877, Chief Joseph was trying to escape the pursuing military as he tried to take his people into Canada. But even at this point, Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull were brought onto the reservation in 1877. Gold had been discovered in the Black Hills. The army had been sent in to clear a pathway so the miners and settlers could move into the area. They were killing the game. The people were starving. The army had created new high-powered rifles that they were using on the trains to shoot buffalo from trains, leaving them to rot along the plains floor. Everything that the people needed to survive was being destroyed. And so against their better judgment, Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull too came onto the reservation. And the deal was that they had to give up their horses and their guns, virtually their entire way of life but that the government would take care of them as long as the grass grew green. And these weapons corporations were given the contracts to supply the people. But of course they began skimming, ripping off the Indian people, and they were providing blankets that were so thin that by the end of winter they had holes in it and the people were freezing to death. The bacon was rancid, the flour had bugs in it, so even after they were promised that they would be in they would be taken care of, the people were freezing and starving to death on the reservation. But even this was not enough money for these greedy corporations. 
And so they set out to create a new public relations campaign. And they brought together artists who did renderings of Crazy Horse back on the war path, killing innocent civilians, raping white women, killing children. And they had phony articles fabricated and placed along with these renderings in all the major newspapers across the country. And of course, the American people were outraged. We thought you brought these savages onto the reservations, they said. And they demanded Congress do something about it. And of course, Congress immediately swung into action and appropriated more money to fight the Indian Wars out west, even though Crazy Horse was sitting in his teepee on the reservation with not a horse or a gun to his name. Fast forward to 1973 when I'm in the Air Force and I'm going to the base exchange one day during my lunch hour and I go to the book rack and I see this big thick book there called the Pentagon Papers. Our government's own secret history about how they fabricated the pretext to sell the American people to support the war in Vietnam. Thank goodness for that brave former a Marine captain in the Marines who had been in Vietnam by the name of Daniel Ellsberg, who was at this time working at the Rand Corporation, helping to write this 7,000-page history, secret history of how the government lied us into the Vietnam War. But his conscience was bothering him, and so he smuggled the papers out at night and would take them to a local co copy shop where he would make copies and expect it at any moment that very ambitious young FBI agent by the name of Bruce Gagnon went busting through the door and arrest him and take him to prison. And he would never succeed in getting these Pentagon Papers to the American people. But succeed he did, thank God, and we learned that story. And then fast forward to 2003, shock and awe, the lies about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and then come to the present day where we hear about Iran, Iran is going to attack Israel. Iran might even attack the United States with nuclear weapons. When in fact, Secretary of War, that former liberal Democrat congressman from California, Leon Panetta, admitted on national television a month ago that Iran has no nuclear weapons today, nor do they have nuclear missiles capable of hitting the United States of America. Fabrication over and over again. Well, I live in Bath, Maine, where today they're building Navy Aegis warships, Aegis destroyers, that are being outfitted with so-called missile defense systems that are being used to surround Russia and China today. When Bush was president, he had one version of missile defense that he was going to deploy in Poland and the Czech Republic. But when Obama came into office, he announced that he was not going to deploy Bush's version of missile defense. And some people cheered. In fact, some people even called me and said, Bruce, why aren't you cheering? And I said, watch the magician's other hand. And soon thereafter, Obama announced that he was deploying a different version of missile defense in Poland and Romania, ground-based launchers. He was going to deploy missile defense radars in Turkey and also put them in Georgia on Russia's southern border. At the same time, Obama today is deploying these Navy Aegis destroyers with these missile defense systems on board in the Black Sea, the Baltic Sea, and the Mediterranean Sea, beginning an, en an encirclement of Russia. At the same time, NATO is expanding eastward, violating promises that were made by the United States at the time of the collapse of the former Soviet Union. At that time, U.S. Secretary of State Jim Baker promised Mikhail Gorbachev that NATO would not expand one centimeter eastward into the old uh, uh, Soviet bloc. But of course, when Bill Clinton became president, he began to violate that promise, began expanding NATO eastward 
surrounding Russia. Of course, Russia is freaking out. Obama, when he became president, you know, he went to Prague in the Czech Republic where he said he wanted to reset relations with Russia and he wanted to get rid of nuclear weapons. And it's true that he did indeed begin negotiations with Russia and they came to a conclusion on a very modest nuclear weapons reduction treaty called New Start. But now Russia is saying they're going to have to pull out of that treaty because NATO and the United States are surrounding them. NATO is now even establishing bases on Russia's border in Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. But why? Why would the United States want to restart the Cold War with Russia? Why would we do that? Well, the only conclusion I can come to is because Russia has the world's largest supply of natural gas today and significant supplies of oil. And don't we know by now that the primary job of the Pentagon is to serve as the resource extraction service for corporate globalization? At the same time, the Obama administration is surrounding China with these missile defense systems. Now putting ground-based launchers in Taiwan, in Japan, in South Korea, and just a few weeks ago announced that they would go into Okinawa. These Navy Aegis warships with missile defense systems on board are also going into Japan, South Korea, Australia, Guam, and Obama is negotiating with Vietnam, Singapore, the Philippines, and other countries in the region to move these warships into their countries, beginning this encirclement of China. But that's not enough. On top of that, the U.S. is now twisting the arm of the South Korean government, demanding that they build a Navy base on little Jeju Island, just south of the Korean Peninsula. Jeju that sits 300 miles from the coast of China. And on the south side of the Jeju Island is a 450-year-old fishing village named Kangjon, where about 1,200 people live, where they've worshipped their relationship to nature for 450 years and worship the passing of their relatives during this time. The Samsung Corporation is now tearing this place apart. The sacred rocky coast called Kangjon is being blown up by the Samsung Corporation. That's right, the same Samsung Corporation that makes your televisions and phones. They have a construction division that is the lead contractor on this project. UNESCO has recognized various environmental jewels on Jeju Island. In fact, the, the J South Korean government had called this area an absolute preservation area. I think that's pretty clear language. Absolute preservation area. But now all of that is being washed away as this Navy base is being built. And onto this rocky coast, Gurumbi, this sacred rocky coast that's being blasted today by Samsung, cement will be poured and, reef, uh, and wharfs and docks will be built to port these U.S. Navy Aegis destroyers and aircraft carriers and nuclear submarines. And just offshore are endangered soft coral reefs that will be destroyed as the seabed is dredged to deepen it to make it possible for these warships to come into port there. Well, we were invited by the village leaders to hold our 20th anniversary meeting there last February. Each year we go to a different country around the world to shine a light on what's happening in regard to these space technology issues. And so we went there and on the first day we were taken to a museum nearby called 4.3. 4.3 stands for April 3rd, 1948, when a massacre began, began that killed more than 30,000 residents on Jeju Island. You know that the Japanese fascist imperialists controlled 
Jeju, brutally occupied, excuse me, Korea for many years, more than 40 years. Korea was occupied by these Japanese fascists. But after the end of World War II, after the Japanese were defeated, the United States took over Korea. And in charge, who did the U.S. military put? They put the former collaborators with the Japanese occupiers in charge. And the people of Korea, as you can imagine, revolted in opposition to this situation. And the U.S. military sent in and directed and facilitated a put-down of the people in Korea. And this, of course, led to the eventual civil war, the Korean War as we know it, that today is still not officially over. There's never been a treaty signed. There's been a truce, but the Korean War remains. So more than 30,000 people killed at the hands of these collaborating right-wing fascists within Korea, directed by the United States military. And so a few years ago, as a way to try to heal the wounds, the South Korean government named Jeju the Peace Island. And the Peace Island today has a Navy base being built there for the United States of America. But why Jeju? You know, Obama recently announced, just a couple months ago, a pivot of U.S. foreign and military policy into the Asian Pacific region. This is a part of a long-range plan that's been under development for some time. In 2001, the Washington Post reported in an article entitled, For the Pentagon, Asia Moving to the Forefront, that the U.S. was going to double its military presence in the Asia-Pacific region. And as a result, you can imagine, the Pentagon will need more bases and more ports of call for its hugely expanding military in the Asia Pacific. Obama followed this announcement of the pivot by going to Australia where he negotiated a deal to send 2,500 US Marines to Darwin on the north coast of Australia. Had you heard that Australia was in danger of being invaded by anyone? And so we had to send in the US Marines to protect them? No, of course not. This is not about defense whatsoever. It's about offense. As it turns out, China imports 60% of their oil on ships. And they use this waterway as they near their country called the Yellow Sea. And just, again, off the Korean Peninsula, Jeju Island, sits essentially at the gateway or as I like to say, the front gate of the Yellow Sea. And that the United States military has determined that we're not going to be able to compete with China economically in the future. But if we control their access to resources, we will hold the keys to their economic engine. A very provocative and dangerous and expensive strategy indeed. In fact, for the last several years, the U.S. Space Command, the military command in charge of giving the Pentagon control and domination of space, because all warfare on the Earth today is what they call net-centric. All warfare on the Earth today is coordinated and directed by military satellites. When we launched the shock and awe invasion of Iraq in 2003, in the initial attack, 70% of the weapons that were used were directed to their targets by military space satellites. Today, the drones that are flying over Afghanistan and Pakistan are hooked up to the satellites. And back in the United States, the pilots are sitting at bases like Creech Air Force Base outside of Las Vegas, where they're looking at their computer screens in real time, split second time, hooked to the satellite and to the cameras on board these drones. And the pilots sit there with their joysticks looking at the screen. Is it Taliban? Is it Al Qaeda? Is it a wedding? Is it a funeral? And then they can hit the button 
And in just, again, real time, split-second time, the signal flies through space to the satellite, to the drone, where they then fire their Hellfire missile, hitting civilians on the ground, killing more innocent people. This is how space technology coordinates all warfare on the Earth today. Well, anyway, the, each year the Space Command annually war games a first strike attack on China. Set in the year 2016, they call it the red team versus the blue team. China today has 20 nuclear missiles capable of hitting the west coast of the United States. And in this computer war game, the United States tries to take out those 20 Chinese nuclear missiles. The first weapon they use is the successor to the shuttle. You've heard the shuttle is being retired. And in its place is being developed the military space plane that would fly down from orbit, drop a devastating attack, both either conventional or nuclear weapons, bunker busters that go under the ground, try to take out China's underground missile silos. And then they follow on with other weapon systems in that first strike attack. But in the computer war game, China is able to fire a few of its nuclear missiles in a retaliatory strike. And it is then that these so-called missile defense systems, what we call missile offense systems, are used. Their job, take out the remaining retaliatory capability giving the U.S. a successful first strike attack. And so after the first strike sword lunges into the heart of China or Russia, the missile defense shield is used to take out their remaining retaliatory capability. And so, of course, this is why Russia is saying we're going to have to withdraw from the New START Treaty because why do we want to reduce our numbers of nuclear weapons when you're surrounding us with missile offense systems? And China is saying that we're going to have to make our nuclear weapons survivable. And that's why they're buying submarines from Russia so they can take their nuclear weapons and put them under the ocean where they can't be so easily taken out in a U.S. first strike attack. Well, just prior to the 2008 election, a very dear friend of mine in Maine, an old man by the name of Herschel Sternlieb, said to me, Bruce, have you ever heard of the Crown family in Chicago? And I said, no. He said, go home and Google it, Crown, C-R-O-W-N. And so I did, and what I learned was that at the time of the election, the Crown family was the majority stockholders in General Dynamics Corporation that owns Bath Ironworks, where I live in Maine, that today is building these Navy Aegis destroyers with these so-called missile defense systems on board. And as it turned out, the Crown family collectively gave Obama $500,000 for his 2008 run for president. In fact, they also raised money for him within the military industrial complex across the country. And so after the election was over and after Obama had won, Aviation Week and Space Technology Magazine reported that Obama received more campaign donations from the military industrial complex than the right wing war hawk John McCain did in that presidential election. The Crown family is also a Jewish family and raised money for Obama nationally within the Jewish community. So remember what I said early on, soon after Obama became president, he announced that Bush's version of missile defense that was supposed to go into Poland and the Czech Republic would not be deployed. And instead, he moved forward with a different version that benefited the General Dynamics Corporation. 
The version that Bush wanted to deploy was a Boeing Lockheed Martin version of missile defense. The cost of the standard, what they call DDG-51, Navy Aegis Destroyer, previously has been $1.5 billion each, a lot of money. But a new version is now, for the first time, being built at Bath Ironworks. In fact, the Navy didn't want this ship because it's so expensive that they said it was going to harm their shipbuilding budget. But Obama said, no, you have to build it. And just a few weeks ago, Associated Press reported that this new high-tech version of Aegis destroyers will cost somewhere between four and seven billion dollars per ship. And so Obama clearly is rewarding the General Dynamics Corporation for helping to make him President of the United States of America. Well, you know, the Pentagon's been saying for years that under corporate globalization of the world economy, every country will have a different role. And they say, we're not going to make things in America anymore. We're not going to have jobs in America anymore because it's cheaper to go overseas, right? We're not going to make clothes and shoes and electronics and refrigerators and even many cars. Cheaper for the corporations to go overseas and maximize profits internationally. Our job, they said, at the Pentagon under corporate globalization will be security export. And so it's no coincidence that two years ago I heard that at Sears, you know, Sears department store is a working class people's store, right? It's not a rich people's store. I heard they'd come out with a new line of young boys' clothes. And so a friend and I went to this nearby town to the Sears store and in we walked and there indeed in the little boys section were a new line of little boys military uniforms and camouflage clothes. And the message to working class kids across America today is this is all you're going to be. And so thus it's no coincidence that today in America the number one industrial export product is what? weapons. And when weapons are your number one industrial export product, what is your global marketing strategy for that product line? The more war, the better. And there we are. Security export. Our future under corporate globalization. Well, we see this manifesting itself around the world particularly these days on the African continent. I was watching C-SPAN a couple years ago, and I saw this general that they said was in charge of all the 50 state National Guard units. And he had this big map of the African continent. And he said, we're now assigning each of our 50 state National Guards to develop a relationship, a basing relationship, he said, with each of the distinct African countries. Why? Well, of course, to take out terrorists. But terrorists, you know, today are defined as anyone that stands in opposition to the interests of corporate globalization as they attempt to extract declining resources around the world oil, natural gas, water, minerals under the African soil that are needed to build laptops and cell phones. This is what it's all about today, resource extraction service. And so it's no coincidence that the Pentagon has created a relatively new command called AFRICOM or Africa Command whose job it is to go into Africa and secure it to the interests of corporate globalization. Little lily pad bases, they call them. Quick interventionary jumping off bases all over the African continent, giving us control and domination, all coordinated and directed with space technology. 
Some people say, Bruce, didn't we invade Libya to protect the people there? Didn't we invade Libya because Gaddafi was a bad guy? And I say, no, we invaded Libya because Libya has the largest supply of oil on the African continent. That's why we invaded Libya, the United States and NATO together. But let me just reassure you all. Let me reassure you. I know you're getting nervous and upset. There is an Achilles heel for every plan for global domination. There's an Achilles heel. And what is that Achilles heel? It's called money. This Pentagon has long bragged that Star Wars, moving the arms race into space, will be the largest industrial project in the history of the planet Earth. And some time ago, a few years ago, in one of the industry publications called Space News, they had an editorial where they addressed this very issue. They said, look, we have to be responsible corporate citizens. We've got to come up with a dedicated funding source to pay for all of our plans, and we have. And we're now sending our lobbyists to Washington to secure that funding source. And they said it is called the entitlement programs that officially in America are Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and what's left of the welfare program after Bill Clinton got finished with it. These are the programs that the military industrial complex has targeted for defunding in order to pay for endless war on behalf of corporate globalization. And so it's no coincidence then that we now hear the Democrats joining with the Republicans saying that, well, you know, we're going to have to raise the retirement age on Social Security because of this fiscal crisis. We're going to have to make some modest reductions in Medicare and Medicaid, it, Medicaid because of this uh, austerity uh, situation. That we're going to have to reduce people's a monthly allotment on food stamps because of this terrible fiscal crisis we're in. But of course you know that the Republicans and Democrats are totally united when it comes to giving money to Wall Street or to the military industrial complex. You know that in your own community when you see Democrats slavishly on their knees doing the bidding for Boeing Corporation and other weapons corporations. You know that for a fact. And our communities increasingly become addicted to military spending because it's the only game in town anymore. So how are we ever going to end war, war and this addiction to violence that we have in America, as long as our communities are addicted, are chained like, like a slave, chained to this military industrial complex. Let me give you two illustrations. Colorado Springs, where the Air Force Space Command is headquartered. Fort Carson Army Base is now expanding into southern Colorado, wants to take cattle ranchers, lands, because of their new high-tech weapon systems. They need bigger training areas. And now these right-wing, conservative, patriotic cattle ranchers in southern Colorado are organizing to fight the United States Army. <laughs> and also, also across Colorado Springs are a slew of these weapons contractors who service the Space Command and the Army. And 50% of the local economy is connected to the Pentagon today. Huntsville, Alabama, where the Army Space Command is located, where NASA's Redstone Arsenal is located. And again, a slew of these weapons contractors are located servicing these 
military machines. They call it the Pentagon of the South, where 75% of the local economy is connected to the Pentagon spending. How will we ever get out from behind this eight ball? Well, the peace movement is always saying no. No war in Iraq. No blood for oil. No war in Iran. Of course, we have to say that sometimes. But what is our yes? What is our alternative, transformative vision to help us get out from behind this eight ball? What is our unifying vision across our progressive community that benefits labor unions, that benefits the environmental community who says they want to end climate change when we have the Pentagon as the biggest polluter in the world and it has the largest carbon boot print on the planet? What is our unifying vision? Who's going to create jobs in America so that we can get out from behind this military industrial complex? Who's going to create jobs? Where will the investment come from when the corporations are moving overseas like rats off a sinking ship? Who's going to invest back here at home? Where's that money going to come from to create a solar society and for health care and education? Well, thank God for the University of Massachusetts at Amherst Economics Department, who in December 2011 published a definitive study on this question called the U.S. Employment Effects of Military and Domestic Spending Priorities. And they said, yes, it's true. If you take $1 billion and you invest it in military production, it's true, you create 8,600 jobs. Absolutely, we acknowledge that, they said. But if you take that same billion dollars and you put it into home weatherization, something we need where I live in Maine, because we have the oldest housing stock in America. I live in an intentional community, 15-room house, built in the late 1700s. It's leaking. We had an energy audit, and they discovered that we had the equivalent of a four-foot hole that we were using to generously heat the entire neighborhood where we lived. And so we had our home weatherized. It was very expensive. But state and federal weatherization programs are being cut today. And so for many poor people, this is an impossibility. But they said in this study that if we took that billion dollars and didn't put it into military production, we'd create 12,000 jobs doing home weatherization for every billion dollars. Or if we put it into health care, we'd create 12,300 jobs. Or if we put it into education, we'd create 19,100 jobs per billion dollars. Or if we put it into, my favorite, building a national rail system, getting us out of our gas-guzzling cars, helping in a very small way solve for our real problem today, which is climate change, preventing the need to go to war endlessly for oil, we would create 19,675 jobs per billion dollars. Now, let me check with you. I've been taking a poll all along the way. I want to see how you differ from the people from San Diego North, okay? I'd like to see a show of hands. Those of you in favor, of taking a billion of your tax dollars and putting it into military production, creating 8,600 jobs, please raise your hand. Hi. Those of you in favor of taking a billion dollars of your hard-earned tax money and putting it into building a national rail system, connecting every corner of the country, creating 19,675 jobs per billion dollars, please raise your hand. All right, well, there you go. You're, you're, you're just like everybody else. <laughs> then why in God's name, tell me please, are we not making a collective demand 
across the progressive community, calling for the conversion of the military industrial complex that would benefit labor unions by giving more jobs, benefit the environmental community by helping in a small way even solve for climate change, ending our wars for oil. Why in God's name are we not joining hands across the progressive community, working together and making this demand? Well, you know, there was once another time in America where we had an intractable, dark, evil economic system that people thought would never end. And at the time, most politicians and many religious leaders and most newspaper editors supported this dark, evil economic system. And here we are today, shackled and chained like slaves to this dark, evil economic system we call the military-industrial complex. And how do we become free human beings again? Well, we should remember the words of the great abolitionist, Frederick Douglass, who told us, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. So again, friends, what is our collective demand today? Our progressive movements, I think, suffer from what I call the business model of organizing. Our strategy is singularly focused, very much guarding our own particular interests, our own particular issue, not working well with others, guarding our resources, our volunteers, our media contacts, the business model of organizing, everyone for themselves, dog-eat-dog competition. Well, the way out for us is collaboration and cooperation. And joining hands across the bottom of the pyramid, the 99%, joining hands with each other, realizing that the base of the pyramid is stronger than the top of the pyramid where the oligarchy or the 1% reside. Physics tells us that, that the base is stronger than the top. The base is what holds up the oligarchy. So if we begin to connect the dots between the issues and share our, artic our articulation and build support for a unifying national demand to convert the military-industrial complex, to save social progress from destruction, to help save the Mother Earth that is under attack today, that is taking a pounding today by the U.S. Pentagon war machine and its NATO allies. Our Mother Earth is thrashing about wildly as her body is in toxic shock. And the future generations are pleading with us, they're pleading with us to take a trip to the Wizard of Oz and get more courage and more determination to stand up to this dark, evil economic system that has a, our hearts and our souls chained, chained like slaves to endless war. Let me leave you with one question, and I ask you to think about it, and I ask you to talk to others about this question, maybe even ask others what they think. What is the number one job today of a human being on this planet Earth. What is our job as a human being? What's the difference between you and a tick? Thank you all very much. The American Empire is collapsing, the world collapsing by 2020. In terms of The strategy to deal with this collapse is two basic things. Number one is to recognize that you people here in America are really no longer needed as 
uh, workers because they can get uh, people overseas to work cheaper. Uh, you're, you're no longer really needed uh, as consumers because how many more uh, cars and TV sets and refrigerators are you going to buy when there's India and China where there's unlimited market? So basically you're superfluous populations. And so the goal now is to reduce you Americans into neo-feudalism where we get rid of public education, we get rid of health care, we get rid of social security and on down the line. And to extract those resources that would go into social progress and put them into paying for this ever still expanding military empire. Second strategy is to trilateralize, is to globalize the empire, to turn NATO into a global military alliance and to get the quote unquote allied countries to help pay for this expanding NATO on steroids. That's why the United States has South Korea build the base on Jeju Island that the U.S. will use. And of course, South Korea then has to cut its social programs as it moves more money into the military, but that, that's okay. Uh, our friends in Canada, our friends in England, our friends in Australia, uh, Germany, other places tell us the same story. Social progress is being defunded in their country. Money is moving into the military as they become ever the more involved in NATO. And so I believe that the strategy has to be is if you want to beat the empire, if you want to take down the empire, you of course have to resist these manifestations of the empire, but you also must at home fight ever the more stronger for social progress because it's like two trains heading for a collision today. One train called social progress, health care, public education, and the like. The other train, endless war to benefit multinational corporations. One of these trains has to be derailed. So if you fight for social progress, you help bring down the empire. It sounds like you're uh, suggesting change in uh, political policy is determined by politicians, by Congress. Uh, Congress has to make a No, I don't think our answer is going to come from electing the right president or electing the right senator or congressperson because I think that the multinational corporations have locked down Congress. They've literally drowned our democracy in this country as they're doing again around the world. This isn't just happening to us. And so I think one answer is that we have to move into more active resistance, nonviolent resistance against the military industrial complex. Again, we have to call for the conversion of the military industrial complex because there are clear winners and losers as the Pentagon budget expands in this country. And so we have to bring the, the quote unquote losers together, uh, which are increasingly becoming more and more uh, of the people. When I was in Santa Monica just two weeks ago, at the very moment I was there, students marched on the Board of Trustees at Santa Monica Community College because they were getting ready to pass a 300% tuition increase. And a hundred of these students were tear gassed, several were taken to the hospital, and these students understand that there is a war against education in this country and that it is in, in their interest to stand up and to resist this nonviolently. This must be done. And so increasingly we see more and more people. We're going to see more and more elderly people suffering as cutbacks in Medicare and Medicaid 
and in Social Security gets harder and harder for working class people to get because the age limit is extended. We're going to see widening numbers of people that are on the outside looking in and we've got to bring those people together in order to help deal with this. And we also have to globalize our movement. We have to understand that the fight on Jeju Island is as important as the fight against Social Security cutbacks here and that by linking our arms around the world and helping to defeat key strategic uh, basing arrangements that the U.S. is trying to establish in places like Jeju is an important issue for all of us. If we can defeat the U.S. plans to build this base to help surround China in order to control China, we will help demobilize this aggressive military machine. So we have to begin to, again, connect these dots between all these issues and fundamentally take down the corporate powers in this country. We have to, without a doubt, understand that the corporations are ruling the roost in America today.